Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the June 2023 CTSS Quiz. It's great to have you aboard, and hard to believe it's the summertime. With that, let's look at 10 cases and see how well we can do answering the questions. The most likely diagnosis in this post-operative patient is... Well, let's look at the images. What you're really seeing here is you're seeing thickening of the transverse colon. There's diffuse thickening. Now, I have to admit the folds aren't enhancing very significantly, but we are in arterial phase. And the ascending colon looks like it has stool in it. The descending colon looks all right. It doesn't have the appearance of ischemic colitis. The vessels, as we see them, look okay, but there's no hyper-enhancement. Ulcerative colitis, usually the folds are thickened, and you lose the haustral pattern. We don't see a discrete mass, so I'm not thinking colon cancer. And so the best diagnosis in this patient was pseudomembranous colitis. When you got more history, the patient had been anti on antibiotics about a month ago. Pseudomembranous colitis classically has the accordion sign and has wall thickness in the range up to 1.1 or 1.2 centimeters, but it can have a very relatively milder appearance and this was one of the cases. Pseudomembranous colitis can involve a section of the colon or involve the entire colon. In this patient post-colon surgery with a drop in hemoglobin, what was the most likely diagnosis? Well, this patient had resection of the left colon, and what do I see? I see a bleed in the spleen with a large subcapsular collection and a large bleed in the left upper quadrant, blood around the uh, liver, and blood down into the pelvis. I don't see a pseudoaneurysm. You surely would consider that. There is splenic laceration, that's for sure. Colon perforation, I really can't tell. I don't see any free air, so that's unlikely. But the best answer is splenic trauma during the laparoscopic surgery with splenic injury, with laceration, and bleed. It's interesting, but the spleen can be injured in colonoscopy, particularly if the colonoscopy is a bit aggressive or if there's adhesions present. It also can be injured during any laparoscopic procedure. Uh, it's usually more common when the spleen is larger or if the patient has any issues in the spleen prior to the primary surgery. The most likely diagnosis in this patient short of breath is well, when you look at the images, both the axial and the coronal, though the axial, I would agree, is most impressive, you see a large left pneumothorax, but the mediastinal structures are pushed to the right. There's consolidation in the right lung base. And yes, this is a pneumothorax, and the patient could have pneumonia and surely does have consolidation in the right lower lung, but with the large pneumothorax and displacement from left to right, we're dealing with a tension pneumothorax. The patient needs an immediate chest tube or the patient can uh, have significant complications. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, this is a subtle case. What you'll notice is there's atrophy of the distal pancreatic gland. You don't see a big duct. And then in the body of the pancreas, there's a little bit of fullness and some textural changes. You see the transition again on the coronal 3D volume rendered. So if you ask me what this is, this is a pancreatic tumor. Now you can argue what it is. Neuroendocrine tumors are vascular. Lymphomas are bulky. Main duct IPMM needs a big dilated duct of at least 8 millimeters. This is a classic example, nothing very tricky, of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But I will say when you look at pancreatic adenocarcinoma that's missed, on initial read, this is the typical appearance, a subtle lesion with glandular atrophy. In this patient with abdominal pain, the most likely diagnosis is, well, what do we see? We see an enlarged body and tail of pancreas, but it looks edematous. There also looks like a halo around the gland. This doesn't have the appearance of adenocarcinoma. It could be acute pancreatitis, I guess. Lymphoma, again, tends to be bulky and infiltrative. However, in this case, when you look at the pancreatitis, the gland is enlarged, and there's a halo around the gland. It involves the body and tail, but spares the head of the pancreas. Classic acute pancreatitis usually involves the entire gland, but not always. 
It involves the head more than the tail, but autoimmune pancreatitis can be segmental. It gives that halo appearance. It gives diffuse edema, and this was a case of autoimmune pancreatitis with elevated IG4. Now, at times with autoimmune pancreatitis, you'll also see involvement of the kidneys, occasionally the biliary tract, but this patient only had involvement of the pancreas. Patient was put on steroids, 40 milligrams for two weeks, and did fine. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what do I see? I see a one centimeter nodule, anterior mediastinum, which is really shown well on the cinematic rendering. It could be a tiny thymoma in theory. It even could be a one centimeter lymph node. Teratoma are usually big, they have fat, they have calcification. This was an ectopic parathyroid adenoma. Ectopic parathyroid adenomas usually are in the lower portion of the thyroid gland, but they can be anywhere in the anterior or middle mediastinum, typically anterior mediastinum. This is a beautiful example. Ectopic parathyroid adenomas typically enhance, and that was the case here. Beautiful cinematic rendering, I have to say so myself. The cystic lesion in the pelvis in this 24-year-old female post-MVA most likely is. Well, you can see the bladder, you can see the uterus is enlarged, and there's a cystic lesion which has some rim enhancement. I guess it could be a fibroid in theory. Fibroids can be cystic, can have some vascularity. They're usually the solid, but 24-year-old fibroid's not a good thought, perhaps. Hematoma, I guess that's a consideration, but isolated uterine hematoma with MVAs without other injury would be unlikely. This is not ovarian, it's uterine or in the uterus, which makes you think a young female with a cystic lesion in the uterus with somewhat rim enhancement, you got to think about a pregnancy. And this was an eight-week pregnancy. Sometimes you will see some fetal parts, but that usually is a bit older than eight weeks. Again, you got to think of this. It's not uncommon for us to pick up unsuspected pregnancies on CT scans. Again, we're always careful with patients about can you be pregnant or not. Sometimes the patients don't know. Sometimes we do um, testing before. But obviously, in a trauma patient, they go right in, particularly these MVAs with these high-level traumas. And then those are the cases you're going to pick up the incidental uh, pregnancies. Sometimes they're ectopic. Sometimes they're like this, classically within the uterine cavity. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, you can see from my choices, I'm saying this is vasculitis. You look carefully, the most impressive thing is the renal arteries bilaterally. And the renal arteries both have beating and nodularity. Giant cell arteritis gives vessel wall thickening and narrowing. Ehlers-Danlos commonly aneurysms of multiple vessels, particularly hepatic artery, as well as the aorta and iliac vessels. Takayashi is usually as the great vessels off the arch, most common left subclavian, but again, it's the narrowing and thickening of the vessel. With fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD, you get beating of the vessels, you get aneurysms, you get stenosis, and the most common vessels are the renal arteries as well as the carotid arteries. This was a great case of FMD. In this 30-year-old female, the most likely diagnosis is, well, we look at the lung fields, you can see there's diffuse bilateral cystic changes in the lung. Could it be CF? CF usually gives you more bronchiectasis, and it's not so diffusely involved. These are not post-COVID changes. Post-COVID, you get fibrosis, and it's usually the basis. Sarcoidosis gives you a range of findings, but would have more scarring and not just purely cystic changes. When you see cystic changes throughout both lung fields like this, you better be thinking of lymphangio, leiomyomatosis. You want to look at the abdomen, make sure there's no myelolipomas of the liver or kidneys. So this was leiomyomatosis. L L M. In this patient with arm pain and history of IV drug abuse, the most likely diagnosis is, well, you can see very nicely on these MIP images, including the images with bone removal, there's about a two centimeter 
aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm off the brachial artery. This is so the choices. This is not a dissection. It's not a traumatic aneurysm. There was no history of trauma. It's, in a sense, a vascular process, but it's not a vasculitis. I don't see irregular vessels. And we are dealing with this um, aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm. And in a patient with IV drug abuse, commonly at injection sites, we see it very commonly in the groin. We see it at the level of the elbow. It's a little bit less common here, but patients are looking for vessels and they find it anywhere. This was a great example of a mycotic aneurysm. Again, MIP imaging is very good at finding and tracking vessels. We typically use a combination of volume rendering and MIP imaging. Well, that's 10 cases. The month is June. I hope you have a great June. Hope you have a great end of the year. And our fellows are leaving any day. And with that, have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.